Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So, we want to talk about one of the oldest techniques in um, AI in one lecture, which will be tough to do. So, we will skip the details of the algorithm. I will post them later. But we want to understand the concept, at least with one example, so how it is done. And um, so that's, of course, about decision trees, quite old technique in AI. <clears throat> and the idea of decision trees is basically what they are saying, that intelligence can be captured, intelligence can be captured in a in a set of if then else rules that provide branching that provide branching for classification so which means from the get-go that decision trees will be a technique like neural networks, like SVM. Um, uh, they do classification. So they have been around for quite some time. So the keywords here are, so you have some rules. And these rules are of nature if, then, else. So if this is true, then this is true. Otherwise, this is true. So human intuition. And we put, a lot of, we put a lot of hope into decision trees back in the 60s and 70s. We said, well, this is the way to go. Expert systems. So you can come up with a million rules. And there you go. You can simulate an expert. Because well, who is an expert? Expert is whoever has a lot of knowledge. So how do you represent knowledge? If I ask you how you do it, how do you invest your money? You say, yeah, if the market is like this, and the government is doing this, and the weather is like this, I will spend my money here. So there must be some rules for any piece of knowledge. And of course, another key word for us here is branching. Because if you cannot branch, you cannot classify. So branching is discrimination. Branching is saying what is what. So now, well, we know we can, we can, uh, we can display or visualize trees as arrays. So if I have a, if I have a tree that contains numbers between 1 and 10, so let's, this is this. 1 and 2 and 3. So I'm going from left to right. And then I have 4. And then I have 5. And 5 has 6, 7, 8. So now this is where data structure course comes handy. 9 and 10. So we put 10 numbers in a tree. Now, this is, this is an abstract idea. So I'm doing AI. It has to be something I can code. So whatever. So we still don't know how we construct a tree that has contains some intelligence. That's a very important question for us to ask in this lecture. How do I construct a tree? I don't want to know all details, but what is the main idea? How do I get a tree? Because we usually get an Excel file with some numbers. So we get data. How do I? construct a tree from a data. So the first question I have to answer, how do I implement a tree? Well, it's not a specific AI question, but we can, we can put a list 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then we can look at the parents. There is no 0, so that's a dummy field, right? And 1 doesn't have, an, doesn't have a parent. So I can look at parents and say, 
Who is the parent of two? One is the parent of two. Who is the parent of three? One. Who is the parent of four and five? Is two. Who is the parent of six, seven, and eight? Is five. Five, five, five. Who is the parent of nine and ten? Three. So a, a tree like this looks like this in the computer. It's basically an ar array. So everything is an array. Everything is a list. Everything is a set. So you don't see it. You don't see the structure. The structure, why? You see it if you're, if you are a, if you are a really good coder. You see it. Well, but it's not in that form. That form is just for teaching. The branching is here embedded. That if you say 5, 5, 5, 5 is the parent of 6 and 7 and 8. So I can reconstruct that tree. So when I get to 5, the question is, where can I go when I get to 5? So when you get to 5, you can go to 6, you can go to 7, you can go to 8. You cannot go anywhere else. That sense of putting something in a, in a, in a data structure is very important for trees because, well, they have been used. Again, another example from undergrad, logical propositions. Quite old example. So for example, you want to say, what is A and B? Or not A and not B. How do I implement something like this? How do I process something like this? How do I write code to, you want to write a program that can take any logical proposition of any length and say whether that's true or false. That requires a certain level of intelligence, I would say. That's, that's reasoning. Reasoning is intelligence. So, okay, if I start with A, A can go to B or it can go to B if a is, let me see, I can do this. So, so then I have two cases. Either is true A or A is false. So that's two, two situations, two possible values that A can have. Then I go to B, and of course then, B can go be also true or false. And then you have to reach a decision. So, so what happens? If A is true and B is true, OK? So if A is true and B is false, or if A is false and B is true, so if I draw this here too. So, true and false. So, this is just for this part, A and B. Just A and B. So, A is true, B is true, is true. A is true, B is false, is false. A is false, B is true, false. A false, B false, false. So, one section of that proposition. So I can deduct. I can reach conclusions. Of course, the trees that we want to work with are not that simple. So what type of trees will you get? So you want to come up with a tree that can do the same type of classification as a deep convolutional neural network? Dense net with 200 layers? <laughs> it, will have, it will have more than three nodes. It will have a little bit more than three nodes, yes. I just said this part. I'm not doing the entire proposition, just because we don't have enough time. So you figure out the rest, which is not a big deal. You just want to make the point that you can use trees to process logical propositions. So fun example. Can we recognize animals with trees? Of course we can. So animal recognition. 
So how do I know what, what type of animal I'm dealing with? Maybe I ask for the color of the animal. Is the animal gray? Is the skin color of the animal gray? How do I come to that? Maybe that's in my data. So, so then the answer is either yes or no. So you realize this yes and no, this branching in two different directions, true and false, yes and no, I'm doing binary classification like SVM did. Very easy. That has been from the beginning a plus point for multi-layer perceptrons because they can give you a number between 0 and 1, not just saying 0 or 1. But SVM, we started with just binary decision trees. It seems to be binary. If I want to do more than binary, that means I need many, many, many more edges to, to emanate from that first node, which would make my tree really messy. So if I want to, instead of 0 and 1, if I want to depict all numbers between 0 and 0, 1, in a, even in a certain discrete step, how many edges would I need? So that would be messy. So let's keep it binary. Let's keep it binary. So OK, uh, it's gray. OK, it's gray. Then my next question is, uh, is the animal large? Is it a large animal? Then it could be, again, yes or no. You cannot tell me as a matter of dignity. Don't come back with fuzzy logic. No, 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 no. I don't want to hear fuzzy logic. Yes or no? I want to keep it simple. So if it is yes, OK, then I make a decision and say, you know what? That's an elephant. It's gray. It's large. What can it be? It's an elephant. It's ridiculously simple <laughs> classifier. Just. That's the attribute that I had. That's the feature I had. So if, if it's no, OK, it's, it's gray, but it's not large. It's a mouse. Oh, I can work with what I have. So then I go to the other side. It's not gray. Um, OK. I ask another question. Can it fly? Can it fly? Then you tell me no. Now I'm, I'm drawing no inconsistent the other, other side just because of I want to be writing more on that side. Doesn't mean anything. Usually we keep it consistent. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So I'm breaking the consistency here just for my own convenience here. So no, what well, is not gray and it cannot fly. It's a frog. It's a possibility. There's a probability that it is. Then I ask another question. Is it active at night? Go back. Yes. No. Well, if it is active at night, it has to be an owl. If it is not active at night, Maybe it's an eagle. Not a realistic animal recognition program, but you get the point. So I'm looking at attributes, which is, which is feature. In the terminology of decision trees, we don't talk about features. We talk about attributes. And then every attribute has a value. So the value of the attribute. And then we make uh, branching. So this is branching. Of course, this is branching too. And then here we make decisions. At the bottom, we make decisions. OK, if you give me a little bit more data and I can graduate from kindergarten, maybe I can do something sophisticated. But I need data. So if you give me the color and the size and the ability to fly it and activity at night, that's not enough to do a recognition of animals. So that means you are giving me a table with just four columns. I would, I would need 200 columns, 300 columns. I would need four or 500 attributes 
of every animal. Is it a mammal? Where does it live? In land or water? So many, many other things to really be, to really do something that makes sense. Okay. So, it, this should convince us, okay, it seems, please keep in mind, we are going to reverse order. Usually in any machine learning AI course, we, we start actually at the beginning with decision trees because this is an old stuff. And then we get toward the end to deep learning and reinforcement agents. I'm, why should we keep with that order? Why? Because I tell you, when we get to a certain point and combine the, the uh, advanced versions of decision trees, you could, if you wanted to, Compete with convolutional neural networks. That's an amazing thing that what the networks can do, decision trees can do too. Such simple concept. But we have to establish a learning scheme for them. How do you learn a tree? How do you construct a tree? Well, we have to plant them. So how to plant a tree? OK. So. Then let's look at the decision tree again, decision trees, and classification. OK, so we, we learned about classification that they draw lines, which means we said, look, if I have two features, feature one and feature two, then I have, I don't know, I have some squares here as a class. Then I have some circles as a class. Then I have some crosses as a class, and I have some triangles as a class. And if we could draw two lines like this, we could perfectly separate those, those four classes. So let's say this is W1, this is W2. I'm simplifying things, not, not talking about bias and everything. Just, just, just. Give me, give me the, cut me a little bit of slack. Um, I just want to make a point. Okay, so if, you, if you're doing something like this with SVM, forget about the animals and logical propositions and things like that. I'm doing something like this. I get numbers. Sometimes those numbers don't even have labels. I don't even know what the name of that column is in that data set that somebody gave me. Just, here, this is my measurements. Classify them. How do you do that? How do, you, how do I apply a decision tree on that? So, okay. Then we can ask, is feature one greater than W1? So that's a question. Is feature one greater than W1? Which means I'm looking at in this direction. So if I look at this direction, I still have uncertainty. It could be squares, it could be triangles. So that I may have the answer yes or no. Then if it is yes, I will ask the question, is F2 greater than W2? Then I will get yes or no. Then I can make a decision. If F1 is greater than W1 and F2 is greater than W2, then I have a square. If it is not, I have a rectangle. On the other side, I will ask whether F2 is, so F2 is greater than W2. Again, I get yes or no. So if yes, I get a circle. If no, I get a cross. So I can do it. I can understand, formulate, conceptualize a typical classification problem, which seems in 99% this is what AI does. We classify data. I can understand it in a way that the decision tree, the boring decision tree that we suffered from it in the second year, can be part of AI. It's unbelievable. Like linear algebra, dot product is intelligence. So, 
Decision trees, DTs, they have nodes that verify nodes to verify slash evaluate an attribute. So we have nodes. This nodes evaluate or verify attributes. Look at the attributes. What are attributes? Your features, the columns, the columns of your data. Then they have branches that embody attribute values. So the branches look at the values. And here, this is the weakness of decision trees. The branching has to be binary. That restricts us somewhat. Uh, maybe you can go to three or four. I don't know. But you cannot go 100. You cannot have a branching of 100. It gets really nasty. We, we lose the overview. So let's keep it at branching two. Is always yes or no, zero or one, young or old, and so on. So let's keep it, let's keep it binary. And at the bottom, the leaves categorize instances. Categorize, which is a slash classify, classify instances, instances. So at the bottom, you classify. We knew that. We knew that for many years, but we didn't really know how to effectively use decision trees because we didn't have algorithms to automatically construct them. In the 70s up to mid 80s, we fundamentally manually created decision trees. So the work of AI expert was to sit down and say, yeah, Gray, yes or no, yes, then I ask here this, and then if it is yes, then I go here. It was manually designed. It would take, you could get a grant and say, the next five years, I want to design a tree like that. And people would give you half a million dollars. <coughs> no, maybe not half a million dollars, but they would give you $100,000 to do it. Because everybody knows that's difficult. This guy has to come up with a tree with 100,000 nodes. Oh my god, he will get lost. So give him some money, make him happy. So you have to design this manually. That was one of the, that was the major restricting point for decision trees. He couldn't automatically create them. How do you create a decision tree? How do you, how do you grow a tree? We didn't know the answer until mid 80s an elegant answer. We had many answers. Yeah, I, sometimes I exaggerate to make a point, and I count on your intelligence to realize that I'm exaggerating. <laughs> so I, I, the onus is on you. So OK. Things are usually not black and white in reality. We know that. But well, OK. So why decision trees, DTs, could be, could be a good AI choice? I don't know how these questions sound. What I'm trying to say is, who says I should go with decision trees? Why should I go with decision trees? We have support vector machines. Why should I go with decision trees? Well, don't you like nature? Trees are beautiful. Wow. Output is discrete. That could be a nice feature for some applications. The output is discrete. I don't need an estimation. I don't need a probability. I don't need a likelihood. 
I need a discrete number. Tell me yes and no. Tell me it is this, it is this, it is this. It is discrete. The output is discrete. If you have a data like this, if I see an application, the output is discrete. First thing I think is not neural network. First thing that comes to my mind is, oh, decision trees. Could be a good choice. Here comes the number two killer for me. So it's a good choice. Decision trees are a good choice when no large data is available. Huh. Somebody gives you a data, send a file, you are new in the company. Here is all the data we have, 200 lines. 200? The hungry monster of deep network, 200? You cannot do anything with it. Decision trees. I can easily come up with a very impressive, good functioning classifier, even if you give me 10, 10 rows, 10 measurements, I can come up with something. We use decision trees if the data is noisy. We use decision trees when classes are disjoint. When we know they are disjoint, when we know that a square does not share anything with a circle, an elephant does not share anything with a mouse. So if I put all attributes together. And there are some other reasons. To me, to me, for me, this is the major reason. Whenever in the practice I have resorted back to decision trees, especially if I, when I do consultation for companies, which happens a lot, decision trees are the best. Low risk, don't, not hungry for data, very reliable, fast to train, compact, do not need a lot of storage, perfect. And do you think the customer cares about how do you call your AI techniques? Yeah, my method is chaotic, evolutionary, null, network, deep, shallow, whatever. Come on. I just need a solution. Give me a solution. Call it whatever you want. So, yes. If, if the data is noisy, generally, Sometimes making things discrete and binary helps because you just get rid of, it's sort of filtering, basically. So if the data is noisy and you are doing some sort of classification with neural networks, you need a lot of representative data to take care of noise. So you need also sample for noise. But if I have just a few sample for noise, a discrete decision tree will be a much better choice. So. <clears throat> So what happens now, so I, I'm trying to answer the question, okay, you convince me. How do I, how do I grow a tree? For example, when I have many attributes, Why do I ask that question? Because you convince me. If I have five attributes, that's an easy question. Even I can sit down like the 70s and on the paper design the tree. I can do that if the problem is small. But if I get an Excel file with 500 columns, which is 500 features or attributes, okay, I cannot do that manually. So how do I do that? You convince me, but Unless you can show me how, I will stick with my MLP and SVM. So the question is basically how to select, how to select the best attribute, how to select the best attribute to generate, to generate the most 
compact branching. Now I'm trying to become more specific. So if you give me even five, you gave me the gray, the color of the skin of the animal, you gave me is it the size, is it large or small, where does it live, is it active at night? How do I know which one of them are more important feature? Is it the skin color or is it the size? Even if I had just two, color and size of the animal, which one is more important? Why? Because I have to put something at the top. The top, if, if you take this tree and rotate it 180 degrees, that's the root. This goes in the ground, which like a tree, this is where you start, and this is where everything is happening and sucking the minerals to other branches. So it's very important to who goes at the top. Who goes at the top? The most important attribute, I would say. Because if the most important attribute is at the top, so the biggest branching happens here. The most important question is the first branching, yes or no? And then the least important, and least important, and least important. So how do I do that? How do I generate? So what is the best attribute with respect to branching? Why with respect to branching? Because this is the secret of decision trees. This is what makes a decision tree a boring decision tree, an exciting classifier. So how do I know? Should here be the skin color of animal, or the size of the animal, or its ability to fly, or its activity at night, or it's a mammal or not? So what does it go here? What does it go at the top? OK, um, flip the coin. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not going to work. You need some intelligence here, I would say. That's what probably makes decision trees very important. So OK, first of all, Let's emphasize again, let's restrict, let's restrict things to binary. Okay, I'm just saying it officially. Okay, guys, I don't want to do non-binary. It would be difficult. Let's restrict ourselves to binary. Everything that you give me is yes and no. Then, okay. Then I have an S, which is the set of my training samples. I have training samples, don't I? If I don't have training samples, I don't have anything. There is no AI if I don't have training samples. So I have training samples. The question is, do I train a network with it or a decision tree with it? So then I have S plus and I have S minus, and S plus are the positive samples, and S minus are the negative samples. Well, positive and negative is for us the words that we selected to do the binary. Yes and no. P, yes, P, no. P true, P false, whatever. Two, two situations, two values only. So I have a set of training data, and some of them are positive, some of them are negative with respect to the classification. Your classification is binary. OK. So which means we know then that the probability of positive stuff is the cardinality of the set of positive samples divided by the cardinality of old training data. And the probability of negative stuff is the cardinality of S negative divided by the cardinality of set everything. Cardinality being the number of members in that set. How, ma how many numbers are in that list, in that vector? Fancy way for saying that, but well, there is mathematical terminology. OK, so when I see this, 
I immediately think about entropy. So what is the entropy of S? Why do I think about entropy? First of all, I don't know anything else. It's, it's early 80s. I, the only tool that I know is a hammer. So I see everything as a nail. Okay? I, everything I see, okay, let's, let's hammer it in. Information theory. I don't have anything else. Do, do you know anything else? I don't know anything else. So you give me a data set, the first thing that comes to my mind, well, let's calculate this entropy. Okay. Maybe we go with this with somewhere. So the entropy is, of course, minus probability of positive samples times the log of positive samples in base 2 minus the probability of negative samples times the log of negative samples in base 2. <clears throat> so what does that mean? So we calculate the entropy of data. So we know from information theory so try to try to, to get into the historical context. So was it the time that we got cybernetics? Norbert Wiener. The entire AI was driven behind the stage with, among other, some notion of information theory. And communication was big. We were trying to figure out how to phone without a cable. That was important. We wanted to, we were talking about, all we were talking about was in the 70s, was information channel. Everything was information. Still is. Everything is information. So we know from information theory that, because the, your question is, is it random? Why we start with the entropy again? Go into the historical context. We didn't have any other choice. And if it is now 2019 and I sit down, I know two, three other more equations that I could use instead of entropy, but all of them come back to entropy. That's such a fundamental equations for us. I, I, I'm not sure when we will replace that with something totally different. That the optimal, the optimal length code, optimal length code, for a message, you see, this is entirely information theory. You want to send a message to somebody, and the question is, what is the optimal length code? So how should I encode it such that I don't waste bits, and then when I send the information and some bits get manipulated, I can reconstruct the message on the other side of the information channel. It's not about learning is about communication. Message with probability P is of course minus log of P in base 2 bits. So the optimal length code for a message with probability P is minus log of p in base 2 bits. So you need that many bits. You need that many bits to optimally encode a message. Just take that as the fundamental statement of the information theory. You need that many bits to encode a message that has probability p. So if you have a, if you have a message that is frequently used, Will we use more or less code for it? Less, of course less, because it's very frequent. I don't want to use big codes for something that I'm sending every five seconds. Now I have a message that only I send every 10 years. Short or long code? Make it as long as you want. You are sending it every 10 years.
the expected the expected number of bits the expected number of bits i put expected in the brackets because we never know the accurate probabilities we always know an estimate of probabilities because we can never observe events infinitely. We can always observe them in a very limited time. So whatever you get is an expected value. It's not the actual value. So entropy quantifies the expected number of bits to encode a class of randomly drawn, randomly drawn samples. So let, let's see how far we come. We started with AI. When we are back to the roots of information theory, we are at entropy. Yes. Because this is it. OK. So what? To construct. A tree, this is what you want. Tell me whatever you want about Shannon and Wiener and anybody else, cybernetics, communication channels. I want to figure out how do I construct a tree when you give me a table of numbers. That's what I'm after. Just push your terminology on me. I will patiently listen to you. At the end, I want an algorithm that takes a table of numbers and constructs a tree for decision making. That's what I want. So, but to construct a tree, we need, we need to know how much how much we gain when we add, how much we gain when we add a specific attribute. So we are trying to nail it down. We are trying to nail it down. OK, I don't care about that, entropy, probability, whatever. I want to construct a tree. So I need to know how much do I gain? So how much value is every attribute adding? You give me a table, go back to the to the first two lectures, we were talking about principal component analysis. You give me a, vac a table of 1,000 columns, and the question is, how much of them are garbage? So same question. I want to know how many, which one of those columns add value to my classification? Which one of them are principal components? OK, then use PCA. I may use PCA. But PCA will give me the 10 principal components. I still have to construct a tree with those 10 principal components of the features. So how much do I gain? I start with the skin color, and then I want to add the size of the animal. Is that beneficial? Would that make my classifier better? How much do I gain if I add this specific, if I add a specific attribute? So you ask this question, then you trim your mind to go after the first algorithm to automatically construct a decision tree. How do I measure the gain? So the question becomes this. How do I measure the gain of any specific attributes, which are features, when I'm putting the first node, then the second node, and then the third node, and then the fourth node? So to put a tree together. OK. So then people sat down and said, OK, let's define a gain function that takes the data and takes the attribute. So you give me a data set, which is your table of numbers. And you give me the attributes. 
separately. What, what I can do at the moment is, of course, I will calculate entropy. So I will calculate the entropy of the data. OK? I don't know anything else. The entropy of data is this, expected number of bits to encode them. So it's an optimal size message. OK, good. So but if I, if I put things in place, I want to reduce the entropy. So whatever reduces entropy is good. Do we agree? Do we agree? Is entropy is chaos. I don't want to have entropy. If my attributes get bigger and bigger and bigger, they lose their discrimination. I want to make them compact, lean, not chubby, lean, not chubby in bits. So how do I do that? Well, I have to take off minus whatever I'm adding, which is minus the sum of the, the number of elements in a set SR divided by the number of total elements in my, in my training data set times the entropy of SR and the, the sorry, this is V, not not R, sorry. SV and V comes belongs to the set of all values of the attribute. So this is all values of all attributes. So what is then the gain? The gain becomes the expected reduction, expected reduction in entropy upon, upon sorting on A. So I'm going, I'm looking at subsets, so SV. SV is, of course, subset of S, of course. So I grab only the instances that are talking about color. I grab only instances that are talking about flight. I'm grabbing instances. So I am looking at different attributes. And then say, if I, if I start with the size of the animal, is it good or is it bad? How much can I reduce the entropy? Because I understood classification as an information channel. My measure of goodness is a minimum entropy. So you see, we can formulate any problem in any framework that you want. If you are good in that framework, if you are an inform, who thought we get SVM in with using linear algebra when everybody was working with backpropagation? So everybody's using a hammer, and you say you buy an ax. I say, oh, I'm working with an ax. Ax is much better. I can destroy things. So if you understand your tool, you understand the problem, redefine the problem within your own framework, you define it and say, we know the entropy is there. I want to select ones that minimize, if I subtract it, I will minimize the entropy. So I want to have a decision tree with the lowest possible entropy. What does that mean? Simplest way, how many nodes you get to construct a tree for a reasonable size problem? 5,000 nodes, 10,000 nodes, half a million nodes. So it, it, it requires a storage. You have to store them, right? So do we have an understanding of bits and bytes? I have to store that tree. I want small trees. I want small trees, oh comes razor. I want to solve the problem, but have low entropy, which based on my limited understanding from IT, has to be small trees. And thanks to God we have oh comes, because oh comes also told us, keep it simple. Keep it simple means low entropy. Because if it is big, it becomes chaotic. Okay, good. So now we want to have an example. 
I'll give you an example. I was, I was torn apart in doing, doing something rather theoretical or doing something practical and say, okay, let's do something practical. Let's say you want to, th this is an example from a textbook that I wrote somewhere. I don't even remember which textbook was, but I'm pretty sure if you type it in a search engine, you will find uh, where, where it's come from. It's called playing tennis. Play tennis. So you want to write a program that somebody uses to make a decision, should I play tennis today or not, or the club owner, should I keep my club today open or not? So, and then you look at the, uh, you look at the measurements. So let's, let's do the measurements. Let's see, I can give you this table. So it's day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight. Data science is fun, isn't it? Day 9, day 10, 11, 12, 13, I'm at the bottom, 14. Okay, good enough. 14, 14. So somebody, the club owner, gives me 14 measurements of 40 day, 14 days. So he has 14 days randomly selected, and he has looked at the outlook. Outlook, and says the outlook on day one was sunny, was sunny again, was overcast, was rainy, was rainy, was rainy, was overcast, was sunny, sunny, rain, Sunny, overcast, overcast, rain. Data collection is a painful process. Oh my God, my hand is painting. Okay, so look at one attribute, which is outlook. Outlook is one attribute. 14 measurements, every day I look at the, I measure or observe the outlook. What is it? Is it sunny? Is it overcast? Is it rainy? What is it? Then I look at temperature. I look at the temperature. And let's say I say I have hot, mild, and cool, just to keep it simple. And then first day, we had hot, 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 mild, Cool, 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 mild, cool, mild, 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 cool, and at the very bottom again, mild. Okay. There are other attributes, but I will skip them. They measure humidity, they measure wind, so there are many more, but I will skip them. I just want to look at two attributes. I'm, I'm assuming that looking at the outlook and measuring temperature, this guy can make a decision, should we play tennis, which means should I, should I keep my club open or not? That's a business decision, right? So if I keep open, will people come? I have to pay for the operation. Very serious. It, it, don't judge who will go play tennis, not me. It's not about you, it's about business. They will pay you good money to write that program. You don't wanna, you don't wanna do it? Refer them to me, I will do it. <laughs> and then the decision first day was no, no, yes, 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 no, yes, one, two, no, and yes, yes, 
yes, yes, yes, no. So these are the decisions. So So of course these are okay, these are the attributes and this is the output which is the decision. Nothing has changed. We are used in AI to somebody give us a table with many, many rows, columns are features. There is usually one last column in most application, which is the desired output. So we made this decision, and he says, the club, the club owner, I assume is a male for some reason, or maybe prejudice. He will tell us that he made that decision to close the, close the club down or keep it open, and they were good decisions. So this is gold standard for him. That's why we want to learn it, because we know these decisions were correct. So you cannot learn shaky decisions. <laughs> the data has to be good. Therefore, when somebody comes and gives me this data, I don't start writing Python code. I spend some days back and forth to make sure that this is not garbage. How do you get this data? Well, we hired a co-op student. He did it. Oh, OK. Which university? It was Waterloo. Oh, OK, fine. Then we continue. <laughs> Who did the data collection? What was the bias? What was the frequency? Was there noise? Were there any manual changes? You have to make sure. Because this is all you get. You have to make sure that the data is good. Data is everything. So we are, we are not talking about that part. So it's not our business, but we usually assume in this course that the data that somebody gives me is, is well posed, is well behaved, is a good data. OK. So now using this table and everything we talked about with information gain, this made up equation, I want to construct a tree. How can, I, how can I construct a tree? If I figure out, so I'm just looking at this too. It's not even difficult. I didn't add humidity. I didn't add wind. I didn't add the weekday. I didn't add all of this. I just have two attributes. So the decision is this. Which one is a better feature? Outlook or temperature? How do you make that decision? Now you tell me if I make that decision and sell that software, that software is not intelligent. Of course it is. How do you make that decision? OK. So example, so Outlook. Now I'm separating the Outlook as one attribute. This is Outlook. Outlook has three values. It has sunny. It has overcast. It has rain. The problem is not try value. The problem is still binary because the classification is yes and no. But I have multiple attribute, multiple values for my attributes. It has nothing to do with the classification itself. So, so if I look, my data set has nine positive and five negative samples. One, two, three, four, five nines. And of course, nine yeses. So you can calculate the entropy of this. The entropy of this is 0 0.94, right? We, we know the, how to calculate the entropy. Minus the probability of positive cases times the log of the probability minus the probability of negative cases times the log of the probability of negative cases. You get 0 0.94, the entropy. The entropy of this data set is 0 
100 more elements such that I can get a lower entropy. So high entropy is not good. <laughs> this is not going to be easy. So you should know the data. So here, we had 2 plus and 3 minus. What does it mean? I have two cases. I have two cases sunny. Uh, one here, sunny, yes. So I have two cases that an attribute sunny has contributed to a positive decision. And I have three that has contributed to a negative decision. So I have five sunny. One, two, three, four, five. So I have a subset. I have a subset, SV, right, of sunny overcast, sunny outlook. I can calculate the entropy of this, 0 0.97, even higher. The subset of sunny days has even a higher entropy than the entire data set. What does it mean? Sunny alone probably is not a good value. I cannot make big decisions with this. So if, if the entropy is 1, if the entropy is 1, just flip the coin. Because everything goes. You look at the overcast. I have four pluses and zero negatives. Overcast, no. Is it no? No, sorry. Is yes. Overcast, yes. Overcast, yes. Overcast, yes. Overcast, yes. Overcast is always yes. How much is the entropy? Do you need a calculator? How much is the entropy? How much is the entropy? Every time I see overcast is a yes. There is no chaos. Entropy is zero. Good feature. Add a feature. That's a good feature. The problem is you cannot classify with one feature. That's the problem. We need more. Rain. We have three positive and two negatives. Entropy is, again, 0 0.97. OK. We calculate these numbers. We have to do something with it because now I have the gain. I calculated the entropy for every subset. SV is sunny. SV is overcast. SV is rain. And now I want to calculate this. Put the number of this here divided by this, which is 14. Calculate the entropy, which I did. Have the entropy of S, which I did. So now calculate the gain for me. How much do I gain? if I put outlook at the top. So the outlook is the root, is the point of departure. You start there, you can make compact decisions really fast. So so what is the gain? of my data set S when I'm looking at Outlook as my attribute, as my attribute features, so which is, we said, entropy of S minus, or let me write it here, minus 5 over 14 entropy of sunny Entropy of sunny minus 4 over 14 times the entropy of overcast minus 5 over 14 entropy of rain. 
So if you put all those numbers here, you get 0 0.246. So if I put all those numbers here, so this is, of course, this, the, the size of this, how many you have, five, you have four, you have five. Calculated the individual entropies, I put them here, do the calculation, I get this. Okay, so the information gain, if I add outlook as in my main attribute is 0 0.246, what does that mean? Nothing at the moment, because I don't have anything to compare to. So which means I have to look at every other attribute in this table to see how much would I gain if I go with temperature? How much would I gain if I go with wind? How much would I gain if I go with humidity? How much would I gain if I go with weekday? So I need to calculate all of that. Oh, I have to write a for loop. Yes, please do. You have to write a for loop. For now, I equal number of attributes to n, and do this. Calculate the gain. Find the maximum. Maximum, we want the maximum gain. So, okay. Okay, next one is temperature. We, we, oh. I intentionally just took two. So in a real case, we have more. We have several hundred of features and attributes. OK, again, S doesn't change. S is 9 positive and 5 negative is the data set. The data set doesn't change. The entropy of the data doesn't change is 0 0.94. And now here also I have three values. I have hot. I have mild, I have cool. Hot, I see that I have two plus and two negative. Hot, no, hot, no, hot, yes. I had one more. Where is it? I don't see it. I must have, I have one more. Maybe I made a mistake. This is hot. Yeah. Because if I, if I mess that up, everything will be wrong. That's the data. I cannot change the data. I made a mistake by reading the data. But if I, instead of hot, I calculate mild, everything is messed up. So, so I have two hots, twice hots that it, the answer was no, and I have twice hot that the answer was yes. What is the entropy? What is the entropy? 50% of the time is yes, 50% of the time is no. Is that a good feature? It's not a good feature. Flip the coin. So, entropy is 1.0, 100%. 100% entropy. Oh my God, so I cannot count on being hot. So it can be hot and I go play tennis. It can be hot and I stay home and watch TV. So mild, I have four pluses and two minuses, which make the entropy to be 0 0.92. And for cool temperature, I have three pluses and one minus and the entropy is 0 0.81. So, so far, the cool temperature is the value of an attribute with the lowest entropy. I like that. It's make the decision making a bit easier. So, then I have to calculate the gain of S given temperature. which is the entropy of my entire data set S minus 4 over 14 times the entropy 
of hot minus 6 over 14, the entropy of mild, minus 4 over 14, the entropy, the entropy of cool, which will give me, you know, I'm at the bottom, 0 0.021. So this is the gain for outlook. This is the gain for temperature. What do you think? Should I start with temperature or I start with outlook? Of course I start with outlook if there is no other feature. If there are other features, I have to do the same thing for all other features. And then I decide. So if, if outlook and temperature is the only thing I have, I will start with outlook. So outlook will go at the top. And that says, my branching would be sunny, overcast, rain. For each one of them, the temperature could be hot, mild, cool. Hot, mild, cool. Hot, Mild, cool. The decision would be yes, no, yes, no, yes, 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 no. Okay. So you could, all we need is this. You're done. That was 1985. Quinlan came up with the idea of decision tree, constructing a decision tree based on information gain. So, get rid of, I will, I will, I will have it somewhere. I will find that textbook and will post this example online. But you can easily find it. That's a, that's a good example. So sometimes for the sake of uh, education, we plagiarize each other's works and then we don't give credit to each other. But these are things that we can easily look up. So who came up with a play tennis example? You find the textbook. Um, so the gain of data set taking outlook is greater than the gain of the data set S taking temperature. That means start with outlook at the top. So assuming there is no other, no other attributes. So outlook, we said it could be sunny, it could be overcast, it could be rain. Then we said, okay, if that's the case, then if it is sunny, what about temperature? Then temperature could be sunny, could be, uh, sorry, could be hot, could be mild, could be cool. Same thing again. Temperature, sunny, sorry, hot, mild, cool, rain, temperature, hot, mild, cool. Then you have to make a decision for each one of these cases. That's the branching. Now, for some of these cases, you have already seen the day. So have I seen a day that it is sunny and it was mild? If I have seen it, that's not a big deal to say keep it open or not. But what happens if there is a sunny day 
and it's cool. That's a very unusual combination, and you don't have any measurement for it. If you don't have measurement for it, and you make a prediction and it's correct, that's intelligence. So if it was something in the table, why do you think we always exclude the training data from the testing? Of course, that would be cheating. So generalization is, how would you tell me about unseen situations? So if this is, so if this If this is never seen, and then you say yes, because now you have a decision tree, that's a performance. I generalized your if-then-else rules to unseen situations. That takes intelligence. How, how we came about that, that intelligence? Using entropy and information game. Really? But those things are boring. Why not if you give it to passionate researchers? So they make something with it. OK. So. So decision tree, construction, algorithm. There, there is, of course, there is a bit more detail necessary. It's already two minutes, OK. The first one was the so-called ID3 which stands for, sorry, okay, we have one minute, iterative dichotomizer version 3. That was the first one. That was the first algorithm that Quinlan came up with, 1984, 1985-ish. And a better version, this was entirely based on what we talked. So that for loop, plus the information gain, plus the manual example, that's ID3. That's in MATLAB, that's in Python, that's in R, that's everywhere. You, you use it, people use it, they don't know that's ID3. And there is another one, which is C45 and C5. So this, these are just the names that people have come up with for those algorithms. So, so you don't need to implement it. You just need to use it. So the question is now, what is overfitting? Can you overfit with trees? Of course you can. You think overfitting is just for deep network? No, you can also overfit with tree. How do I know I overfit it? So if you get a very large tree, then you most likely overfit it. If you come up with a gigantic tree, half a million nodes, whoa, take it easy. What did you do? The branching is supposed to help us to come up with compact trees, not many levels. Although it's logarithmic to go in, but it, is, it takes some time to, to, uh, to construct them. We prefer short, small trees. Who comes razor? So why is that? How, how, how can I? Why is that? Why do we prefer short trees, small trees? Yeah, but what is the rationale that a smaller tree is a better tree? Same, apply it to same. Why do we still, uh, not, not all of us, some people, why, why the, the sane ones among us still prefer shallow networks? Shallower networks. If I can do it with seven layers, I will not use 15 layers. Why is that? 
the probability that a small network or a small tree randomly fits a difficult problem is very low. But the probability that a gigantic tree fits everything is very high. So the smaller, the more customized it has to be. So how do we avoid overfitting? We say this and we stop. How do we avoid overfitting? Well, you can grow the full tree, and then you do some post pruning. Prune the tree, right? Let it grow as much as you want, but come up and say, OK, this branch, I don't need it. This branch, I don't need it. This branch, I don't need it. How do you know you don't need it? K-fold cross-validation is also applicable to trees. So I can cut the branches, do the validation. Do I drop or stay the same accuracy? If it says accuracy, if it's the same accuracy, this branch was not necessary. Of course, if I want to implement this, it's more than half a day job. K-fold cross-validation running on a decision tree. It takes a little bit of time, but we have packages that help us. B, so stop when branching not statistically statistically significant significant i like to be more because i generally do not prune my trees in the backyard i love them to just let the let the animals and birds prune them so i just don't touch them i don't touch them unless they are sick so I will go with B. Stop when the branching is not adding any value anymore. What is value? Careful cross-validation. There's nothing else. <laughs> Leave one out. I have 10% of the data using for va validation. I grow and grow. So when I add, when I add branches, I validate. Am I getting the same result? Why should I add? Why should I branch more? When my accuracy is staying the same. OK. I will, I will upload some additional information. What I didn't talk about is random forest. When I don't create one tree, I create many, many, many trees. So I have many, many, many decision makers. It's like a room full of experts with random forest. You can, deep, you can beat deep networks in many cases. So I will also uh, provide some information on uh, random forest. <coughs>